Okay, everyone, could I, uh, let's get started. And uh, we're very lucky today to have a giant in the field of human rights with us uh, today. Uh, and uh, I think we have uh, no one more fitting than our own giant of human rights to, uh, to introduce her. But before I turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Howard Hassman, uh, just a quick announcement to the PhD students. Uh, we'll be meeting in the Sunshine Room uh, after this with Dr. Payne. So. Good afternoon. I wish I were a giant. One of my pet projects is uh, human rights for short people. <laughs> Especially as the younger generation gets taller and taller. It's getting really annoying. Uh, I'm Professor Rhoda Howard Hassman. I'm the Global Canada Research Chair in International Human Rights at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University. And it is my very great pleasure to introduce Lee Payne to you today. I made the mistake of coming up here to have coffee with her at 11 in the morning, and I realized I should have come up and had coffee with her at 9 in the morning, because uh, I enjoyed her company so much, and she is truly a brilliant and very interesting lady. Uh, sorry, that's very old-fashioned. Woman. <laughs> Person. Anyway. <laughs> Professor Hey, now you say girl. Right? Girl. <laughs> She's a great gal. Yeah, girl. <laughs> um, she is a professor of sociology, especially in of Latin American societies and a fellow at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University, a very prestigious position. And she is also a visiting professor at the University of Minnesota. She received her PhD in political science from Vienna University in 1991 and since then has produced an enormous number of books, as far as I can tell, among which is uh, Resilient Industrialists and Democratic Change, published by Johns Hopkins in 1994. Uncivil Movements, The Armed Right Wing and Democracy in Latin America, published by Johns Hopkins in 2000. Unsettling Accounts, which some of you have read, Neither Truth Nor Reconciliation in Confessions of State uh, Violence from Duke University Press in 2008. And her uh, latest book, aside from her many other book chapters and articles, uh, with uh, Tricia Olson and Andrew Ryder, is called um, Transitional Justice in Balance, Comparing processes and weighing efficacy. And she will uh, lecture from that book this afternoon. So thank you very much and welcome. Okay, the other way you can be a giant is you wear taller and taller shoes, <laughs> heels. So I wanted to tell, talk to you about this book. It came out in September. Um, and I think it's fitting given our audience because this book I published with my graduate students at Wisconsin. I was at University of Wisconsin-Madison for 17 years before I left and started at, um, at Oxford three years ago. And uh, so the book, because there's so many graduate students in the audience, I thought you would be intrigued by this, that I taught a course on transitional justice, a seminar. Um, and I had the students tease out all the hypotheses in the literature on transitional justice. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term transitional justice, by that, I mean just very generally how countries deal with the authoritarian or post-conflict uh, past, the conflict past. And we look specifically at the mechanisms used to, dealing, to deal with that past, like human rights trials, um, truth commissions, reparations, lustration, amnesty laws. So the students did this enormous task of reading the literature and mining it for hypotheses, and then their assignment was to use those hypotheses in a single case study. Um, and so they did that, and sometimes working in teams and doing regional studies or multi-country studies, but mainly they did single case studies. And at the end of the semester, a couple of the students who are uh, Tricia Olson and Andy Ryder, my, um, my collaborators in this book, said, why don't we do a cross-national analysis to see if any of these hypotheses hold up um, in, in comparison across cases instead of generating more single case studies, which was about where the literature was at the time. And so we did it. We got a little bit of money from the department and then from the political science department at Madison, and then we applied for money. So we got, we just continued to get uh, little pots of money here and there to pay them and make their way through graduate school. And, to, and we hired some research assistants at the undergraduate level. Um, and much to our surprise, we actually came up with some findings 
um, and, and actually got a book published out of the project. This is published by the universe, United States um, uh, Institute for Peace, which gave us one of the grants, so one of their um, stipulations is that we also publish our book with them. So it came out in September, and I want to thank um, our, my hosts here uh, for the opportunity to present these findings to you. What I want to do is not only um, tell you uh, what our findings were, but also to go beyond that. You know, that was in September when it came out, which usually means, I can't even remember when we stopped writing it, but you have to stop well in advance of getting it into print. So we've since done a little bit more thinking about it and begun to sort of challenge our own um, findings in the book. So I'm going to present for you a sort of summary version of the book and then some of the post-publication tests that we've been, uh, we've been developing to see if we're right, <laughs> to sort of pr further probe if, uh, if we still agree with our findings now that they're published. Uh, and I'll just jump to the punchline. It might surprise you that we do still agree with our findings that are published in the book, uh, not surprisingly. So the book, I don't know if you can see very well up here. We've had to do some little manipulations to get things to work, and, and it's kind of faded a bit. But the book is, is really looking at two different sets of hypotheses. One set is why do countries adopt these mechanisms? in the first place? Why do they uh, adopt truth commissions or trials or amnesties or lustration or reparations? And in that, that's really most of the book is probing that question. Um, but what was more interesting for us is the second, you can't even say second half, the very end of the book, which is what impact does it make? So you adopt these mechanisms and it's interesting to know what mechanisms are within the range of possibility, but more importantly for us as human rights scholars is does it make a difference if you do have a trial or a truth commission or an amnesty, et cetera? And we decided to, to measure that by looking at human rights improvements and improvements in the level of democracy. And we picked those two goals partly because um, we we're interested in those political goals, but also because they're measurable. There already is existing data on improving uh, human rights and democracy. So I'm going to tell you what our findings are and then uh, talk about what we're doing now to think more about those findings. Uh, just briefly, um, we cover every country in the world and we start gathering data in 1970. Uh, we finished in 2008. Um, and we're going to do, one of the things we want to do is to bring that up a little, little, um, you know, to, to a couple more years. And we used as our source of data the Keysing's World News Archive. And we chose this source because we felt that it was the least biased. A lot of the other studies, now there are a few more studies that do cross-national analyses, use U.S. State Department reports. Um, we thought Kiesings had a broader coverage, not just where the U.S. was involved, but also, uh, also covered more of the range of mechanisms that we were looking for. And as I mentioned, we really look at these five sets of mechanisms, but most of what I'm going to talk about with you today are the first three that are up there, uh, trials, truth commissions, and amnesties. The reason for that is we're not convinced that we have uh, a full set of cases of lustration and vetting or uh, reparations. We have very small number of reparations. We know they're vastly, uh, there's a vast more number of reparations, but they didn't come up into Kiesings. So I'm going to report mainly on these three mechanisms. It's important to say a little bit about how we defined these three mechanisms because most studies uh, use their own definitions. And so the field, if you could call it such, the field of transitional justice, doesn't have consensus on what is a trial, what is a truth commission, and, and certainly not on whether amnesties should be included in tra transitional justice mechanisms at all. Um, in terms of the trial, we decided that we wanted to see if a verdict had been rendered and that we would only count those trials in which there had been a verdict. Our assumption for that is that in many cases, trials can be shelved um, or dismissed 
And so if, there hasn't, if it hasn't been completed, meaning that there hasn't been a verdict, then we felt like we couldn't include it since we wouldn't uh, expect uh, perhaps for those trials to have an outcome uh, or have an impact. But we are now looking at something more broadly called judicial activity to see if the cost associated, the sanctions associated with even being investigated or charged and arrested could have that deterrence effect in terms of human rights. So I'll come back and mention that again. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Truth Commission, we also, um, in our case, we included even those Truth Commissions, which might seem to you a bit contradictory, um, because you might think that a report would bring closure to a Truth Commission the same way a verdict does in a trial. But many Truth Commissions came to an end and they still never published a report. Right. So we look at truth commissions that do have an end date, not the ones that are ongoing, but we didn't limit our study of truth commissions to those with a report. Our argument is that report might determine whether it was successful or not because then it's more publicly accessible. So it would be more a measure of success rather than whether a truth commission existed or not. Um, but others only include truth commissions with reports. So uh, that's one way in which our data is different than others. We have not yet found any transitional justice study that includes amnesty in a database. There is an amnesty database put together by Louise Malander, but she's not focused on transitional cases, and she's not also focused on uh, human rights violations. Um, she's at the University of Ulster, and you can get this uh, data online if you're interested in looking at it. And we're now crossing our amnesty information with Louise's to see if we're coming up with the same set of amnesties for these kinds of violations that we're looking at. But a lot of the literature doesn't include amnesty because they don't think it is a form of justice. In our view, uh, transitional justice means what mechanism was used to allow for that transition to take place and some form of uh, justice, but the measure, we can't evaluate any of the mechanisms in terms of how just are they. We can think about trials that are not particularly just. We can think about truth commissions that aren't particularly just. And similarly, amnesties uh, may not be a good measure of justice, but they might be a good measure of that transition process. Um, and the other argument for including amnesties is that it is the most common mechanism used to transition from authoritarian rule in post-conflict situations. And to not include it is to not look at the range of choices that countries make in determining how to transition from this earlier period. Um, and, uh, and legally, in order to have an amnesty, you have to determine that a crime took place. So just acknowledging these past acts as a crime for which there would be amnesty is kind of similar to a truth commission that acknowledges a crime that took place without necessarily requiring re retributive justice in the aftermath. So that's just our little explanation for why amnesties are included. The main hypotheses that we looked at in terms of studying the impact of transitional justice we put into four categories. Um, in max, what we call, these are our categories, uh, what we call maximalist approach is uh, one that calls for the maximum level of accountability or trials, human rights trials. The argument of a maximalist approach is that unless you uh, hold perpetrators accountable for past violations, then if, if you do not hold them accountable for past violations, in other words, you give them an amnesty, this is likely to harm both the deterrence effect of human, of human rights by not assigning any cost for committing these violations in the past, but also failing to build those institutional mechanisms like rule of law and, the, and, the, and strengthening the judiciary, et cetera, that would allow for improvements in human rights. So you can think about a maximalist approach as being a sort of deterrence approach, that the only way you can deter human rights violations uh, is by having uh, human rights trials. And, if you, and amnesties, on the other hand, are believed in this maximalist approach to harm both that transition from authoritarian rule and the strengthening of democracy and the human rights profile of uh, these countries. The minimalists, oh, so in maximalists, I think if you were to associate a name with it, 
Um, there's a famous article by Diane Orentlicker, um, Juan Mendez's piece, uh, Catherine Schicking's work on trials. Um, I would put those, Naomi wrote Ariaza, are all considered part of this group that we term maximalist. They hate it that we call them that, but <laughs> anyway, it's convenient for us. Uh, minimalist approach is mainly comes out of Snyder and Vinjamuri, also some of Jan Elster's work. Um, that argues that in fact these transitional societies and governments are so vulnerable and fragile that imposing a requirement of retributive justice is likely to jeopardize the transition um, and, uh, and, and the sort of future of human rights. In other words, you need to give amnesties during this fragile moment and give governments the capacity to negotiate with armed groups in order to allow for the transition to occur to strengthen democracy and to prevent future violence. So it's a kind of expediency uh, approach and um, you know that if you were to go for human rights trials, this would likely catalyze spoilers, you know, members of the old regime who might um, react against any kind of prosecution for what they consider to be their own heroic and patriotic acts, overthrow the government and prevent this transition from occurring and thereby um, putting off human rights improvements. Right? So that's a minimalist approach. The moderate approach um, we, we would put in, say, Priscilla Hayner's work on unspeakable truths and the promotion by Hayner and also the International uh, Center for Transitional Justice of truth commissions as providing some middle road, you could call it. Not maximum accountability in the form of human rights trials, but neither um, being so afraid of the political constraints or consequences um, that, that is a full blanket amnesty. Instead, trying to find some form of accountability um, that holds perpetrators accountable, brings justice to victims, but also can, will not catalyze these spoilers to uh, react against the transitional government. Um, so their argument is that truth commissions provide that middle road, that pathway of both accountability and stability. The last approach is fairly new, and the International Center for Transitional Justice has used it more than probably any other group. I was in New York giving a talk to them a few weeks ago, and um, they argue, in fact, that none of these three um, maximalist, minimalist, or moderate approach exists anymore, and everyone is using a holistic approach. It's not what I'm seeing, but it's interesting perspective from their point of view. The holistic approach that they advocate and that they believe is um, much more prevalent in the field of transitional justice is that transitional societies are facing so many levels of atrocity and economic fragility and needs of victims but needs for stability that one mechanism can't solve all the problems and instead you have to use a sort of set of mechanisms or a holistic approach to deal with the past and to provide for the stability and, uh, and accountability. So those were our four main groups and we, uh, after creating this database, went through to see who's right. And, okay, it does show up now. And so what we did was we found certain measures, as I mentioned earlier, certain measures of uh, democracy and human rights. So if you see, uh, we use the, here the Freedom House uh, scale of civil liberties. We use the, also their scale on political rights. We use the Physical Integrity Index, which is Singrinelli and Richards, for those of you who know it. And then, so we use those two measures of, um, well, actually I should say, we used more than these two measures for a democracy. We also used the polity score, but I didn't put it up here because it's really just, we came up with the same thing with polity. And then we used two measures of human rights, Singrinelli and Richards, physical integrity score, and the um, political terror state scale. What we found, for those of you who are pursuing careers in transitional justice, is that there was a statistically significant and positive outcome if a country had used some form of transitional justice of those five measures that I mentioned earlier. 
So um, Polity, oh, I see, wait, I did have Polity up there. I didn't see it the first time I looked at it. So uh, other than Polity, all of the other measures showed this positive outcome, you know, or the probability that you would have a positive outcome if you used some form of transitional justice, or if countries used a, a form of transitional justice. So you can, I think this was reassuring to us that, uh, that in fact it does make a difference, or appears to make a difference if you use something to deal with that uh, violent past. When we started to look at individual mechanisms, we weren't finding statistically significant and positive relationships. So for trial only, we found no effect statistically. Uh, but again, in amnesty, we found no effect statistically. If you only used an amnesty or only used trial. When we looked at tr uh, truth commissions alone, in democracy, we saw no effect. But oddly, uh, when we looked at human rights, we found a negative effect. Um, suggesting that using truth commissions alone would have a negative impact on, on improvements in human rights or there would be a decline in human rights uh, scores. Um, so what did we find that was positive? Two combinations turned out to be statistically significant and positive. The combination of trials and amnesties and the combination of trials and amnesties and truth commissions. In other words, when truth commissions were added to trials and amnesties, uh, they went from having a negative impact on uh, human rights to a positive one and also a positive one in, in, um, in democracy, in some of the scores in democracy. So what that has meant in terms of going back to the theory or the theoretical approaches is that the maximalists, we can argue, are right in that trials are crucial. Our trials are crucial to this transition process. Um, both combinations involve trials. But they're wrong about amnesties. <laughs> that amnesties on their own neither brought a negative uh, score, a negative measure for human rights and democracy. Um, and actually, when they were combined with trials, they had this positive effect. So the same thing can be said about the minimalist approach. Um, amnesties didn't turn out to be by themselves positive for human rights or democracy, uh, despite the claim made in the kind of min minimalist approach. Um, and trials didn't turn out to jeopardize these transitions or these movements towards uh, improvements in human rights. The odd thing is, again, this combination that trials and amnesty, which we would think wouldn't go together, were producing the positive effect. And as I've already said, in terms of the moderates, um, no one who's a promoter of human rights uh, and at Truth Commissions is happy with our finding. Um, but we're, um, you know, we're happy to say that Truth Commissions don't always have a negative effect, and in fact, if they are combined with trials and human rights, um, they have a positive effect. We don't understand the negative one, but we're looking into that um, more. You could say then that we've adopted this kind of holistic approach, that there are certain combinations that work where s single mechanisms do not work. Um, but we are more specific than the ICTJ approach by saying what combinations do tend to have this positive effect. And so our task then is to say why. Why is it that we're uh, finding this? Do we have anything to go on in terms of the literature and in terms of our analysis that helps us explain this weird combination of trials and amnesties and trials, amnesties, and truth commissions? So the book is called Transitional Justice in Balance because that's what we are, um, we are thinking is going on um, and what some of our research has led us to believe about what's going on. Um, and here you'll see that we borrow actually a lot from this theoretical literature that already exists. Why are trials a necessary but not sufficient part of this story? It's because they do do some things they do create, we, you know, we're, we're willing to accept that they do create this kind of court capacity and independence, right, strengthening those democratic institutions. It also is a rights-based approach, ending impunity and the right to redress for victims and, and uh, survivors of violence. Also, the punishment associated with certain crimes and their kind of rule of law approach. Um, and, and this notion that no one individual is above the law. Uh, these are all important ingredients, not just for building democracy, 
but also creating a human rights culture in societies. And we think that this is not possible with truth commissions uh, or amnesties, that it really takes uh, prosecutions to have this kind of effect on, um, on rights enhancement, institution building, and, and deterrence. But if trials alone were doing all the work, then we would expect to have more statistically significant and positive effect of trials on their own. And since we're not finding that, we're trying to figure out what is amnesty doing in this story? You know, what, what is the amnesty piece? So going back to the minimalist approach, we think that it may be true that in those early years of transition, that an amnesty is a way to provide some form of stability until there is a strong enough uh, or, the, or the perpetrators of past violence or the defenders of the regime uh, are weak enough to actually allow for prosecution. So this in the literature is often called late, um, late transitional justice. Right? Um, so certainly we think, we agree with the minimalists that it may be lowering political costs. But also, and our own research shows that trials are most likely um, where there has been a collapse of the old authoritarian regime, and amnesties are most likely where there has been a negotiation. You know, this is a Huntington-type approach, and it and it bears up in our in our analysis of the adoption of transitional justice mechanisms. So, where there's been a negotiated transition, it's likely that the spoilers continue to hold political power. So, it's not surprising that in those cases we would have amnesties, since they will be appeased by an amnesty and um, may be catalyzed and have the strength to overthrow in, in cases of, uh, of negotiation um, and, and trials. But we also found that there's some p political economy explanation. Um, this, again, is going back to our research on the adoption of transitional justice mechanism. If you look at this kind of uh, probability graph, let's see, where's my thing? You'll see, this is a little awkward because I have to kind of lean in so you can hear me, but then also <laughs> point with the pointer. So I'm going to move away from the mic for a minute. This, it, which is blue, is uh, no transitional justice. Right? So where the change in gross, in, in GDP is negative, there's a high level of no transitional justice at all, meaning no mechanism at all. And as you move towards a positive change, in GDP, you find that there are fewer of those cases of doing nothing, right, of, and what you could call de facto amnesties. Um, on the, on, in contrast, this goal, if you can see it, um, is trials, and it has the opposite um, curve, so that at negative levels of GDP, you have uh, very few examples of trials you know, this is change, this isn't absolute levels of GDP. But as there's improvements in GDP, there's a higher likelihood of trials. So improvements in, you know, the economic profile is likely to accompany what we would consider to be the most expensive mechanisms, trials. So as if you can, I mean, you can think about this, is if you can afford it, you'll do it. Right? Or this is what our research suggests. Amnesties is a little, uh, Un unclear here, but you still see, if you can, it's sort of red or black, um, that the peak of the amnesty is also, you know, and this period of time that's leading up to, I mean, it's mainly negative, but leading up to no change, right? So definitely on the, on the lower side of improvements in GDP. So we suggest that there aren't just political costs but also economic costs to adopting these mechanisms. And unless international communities are going to start funding these uh, trials and truth commissions, it's more likely that, uh, that poorer countries and ones that are not seeing improvement are going to um, avoid expensive trials. Uh, it also means for us in terms of amnesty that um, the combination is starting to make sense. That is, you can amnesty a whole lot of perpetrators and still put a couple, of on, a couple on trial. So you reduce the cost, both politically and economically, by trying some perpetrators, but not all. So you adopt a much more uh, a, a sort of clear notion of who is the perpetrator that's going to be put on trial, and who do we avoid 
uh, trying because of the cost of putting every perpetrator in the past on trial. So this is where that combination of trials and amnesties is likely to uh, be explained by, uh, by the costs, that, both the economic and the political costs. Um, truth commissions, our argument is maybe outside of this, uh, the, the, these two mechanisms. They do something different. They do something different than trials, and they do something different than amnesties, obviously. Um, and what they do that different is different complements and enhances these processes, this balance that we talk about, but isn't by itself able to carry out the goals that, it, uh, that they set out for themselves in the moderate approach. So uh, they really are victim-oriented forms of justice that may not necessarily have an impact on the government or on human rights records by themselves. Um, but they could complement what's already happening through the trials and amnesty process. Um, and they could, in, in, and also enhance in terms of building that human rights culture and awareness about the past and so on. But can't be measured along the same, you know, the same uh, functions as these uh, trials and amnesties. So that's the basic overview of our findings on the impact. And so what are we doing now? Um, partly what we're doing is we're, we're puzzled by the Truth Commission finding and we're looking into what are possible explanations for the negative finding on Truth Commissions, right? That why we may be able to accept the positive one, we're concerned still about the negative one. And, and specifically, we're going to look at the type of Truth Commission since we know there's a, just saying Truth Commission yes or no uh, may not be enough nuance for us to say what kinds of Truth Commissions are having this negative effect and in what context are they having that negative effect or positive effect in, in some cases. But what I want to talk about, since we haven't done that research, I can't present it to you yet. Those are just our hunches. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is what we have been thinking about, and partly by going out and giving this talk and getting feedback from different people. We're exploring at this moment alternative explanations for our findings. And I'm going to talk to you about four different alternative explanations that, you know, to determine whether they are better explanations for what we're finding than our justice balance approach. So uh, this includes the sort of sequencing and power of trials argument, um, and I would put, associate this with the maximalist argument that it's not amnesties that are doing the work at all, is the argument of the, of the kind of maximalist, but it's really that when you have amnesties and trials, trials have era erased any effect of the amnesty, so they're doing the work. Right? So that's one approach. Um, timing is another one. As I mentioned, we started this in 19, you know, going back to 1970. So that means you capture a lot of those early transitions where this combination was put together, amnesties and trials, amnesties followed by trials. So is it that, as the power of trials, uh, maximalists would argue that trials are doing the effect, um, but because our database goes back so far, we're looking at where amnesties were then followed by trials, that sequencing. And also with this age, the so-called age of accountability or the justice cascade argument of Catherine Sicking, that now there's no option for countries to have amnesty laws. So it's a, you know, it's a whole new world out there and we're only measuring something that happened in the past. We measure this effect 10 years after the transition. So what about the new transition in countries? Would we expect different findings there? Um, we also want to look at context. Right? We can't, obviously, one of the reasons that tr transitional justice tended to focus on individual countries, single case studies, at most two or three, or regional studies, is because every context is really different. So what can our cross-national database tell us about context and nuance in these approaches? And lastly, um, one challenge to our work would be we are overemphasizing, there's a bias in our research towards Latin America, not only because it's a region where so many of these mechanisms occurred, the transitional justice began, you could even say, um, in Latin America as a region. They're the longest ones, so we're seeing the effect more of those countries, and they use this amnesty and trials with or without truth commissions combination. So is it just that our findings are biased uh, on Latin America and this won't bear out in the other regions of the world? 
So I'm going to run through some of these explanations, and in the end, I hope convince you that we're still right, even given these challenges. Um, so I mean, the trials and sequencing argument is really uh, compelling. Um, but if it were true that trials were doing all the work, why, wouldn't, why aren't we finding a positive finding for trials by themselves? In other words, if the argument is that amnesties are irrelevant once there's been a trial, they, you know, they render those amnesties obsolete, they're no, longer, they're no longer effective in protecting perpetrators, then why aren't we seeing amnest, uh, trials by themselves having a positive effect? Um, the other part of this is when we look at, as you can see in this, um, this little table that I put up here, that our, we can't say that these combinations always follow that same sequence of amnesty first and trial after. We have some cases, like South, one case, like South Korea, where the amnesty followed the trial. Remember the trial of the presidents, the former authoritarian presidents in Korea, in South Korea. And we have some cases where they occurred at the same time, trials and amnesties. But most of our cases are cases in which there are multiple, there are multiple mechanisms, meaning there's not one, one amnesty followed by one trial, but there are many amnesty laws, and there are many trials. And so having a perfect and clean sequence of amnesty followed by trial just doesn't exist in reality. Right? It's not, we can't empirically verify that that's the pattern that has played out. And since you have these multiple ones, where do you start and where do you stop? And what, you know, how can you determine what's doing the work, in other words, for these improvements? So one of the things we want to further um, research is whether our notion of verdicts is uh, limiting the impact of trials. Uh, and we've gotten, we've received a National Science Foundation, that's a US, um, US government uh, award, and the AHRC, or Arts and Humanities Research Council, a UK award, to merge our, merge our database with Catherine Sicking and Hanjun Kim's database um, that looks at verdicts as well as pretrial or sort of general judicial activity. So their argument in doing that, in fact, they didn't separate out verdicts from judicial activity, is that they feel that any kind of judicial activity, like an arrest or um, an investigation, is likely to bring the necessary sanction to deter future human rights violators. Um, so we're in the process now of separating from their database verdicts from judicial activity to see if it does, in fact, make a difference, how, what we call trials. If we call any kind of judicial activity trials, maybe it is having a positive effect um, and, uh, and where verdicts are not by themselves. Um, and then we have this sort of timing explanation. Um, we do not have any evidence right now to suggest that amnesties are losing popularity in today's world. Uh, despite the justice cascade, despite the increase in trials, so if you look at this, um, this graph, yeah, you can see it. If you look at this graph, there's definitely been an increase in trials. Uh, that's the black line. So um, you can see that over this period of time that we're researching, there's a spike in the number of trials in the 70s. Uh, and then they continue to have a sort of up and down motion, but generally, uh, 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 you, you know, they're not, they're higher, the number of trials appear to be higher than the number of amnesties. Now when I say rate over here on the top, this is, when we first did it just by number, by count, we were seeing huge numbers of amnesties um, increasing above the numbers of trials. Um, and so we decided to make a proportion of the decisions made for transitional countries. Right, so a number of transitions by mechanism used. Otherwise, you'd have a much higher level of amnesties through this period of time, um, but also a higher number of trials, uh, because as 
countries transition, where you have a lot of transitions, you're also going to have a lot of trials and you're also going to have a lot of amnesty. So looking at it as a rate of uh, transition choices gave us a, what we felt was a more realistic rather than just number uh, count. But you can see that in here, the amnesties also peaked, the light gray line also peaked, even when looking at this rate of transitions, um, but appears to decline in this period of time that we might call the justice cascade or the, the age of accountability with the creation of the, ICE, the International Criminal Court, the ad hoc tribunals in the UN, the, you know, the actions of universal jurisdiction in various places, this sort of awareness of uh, the responsibility to hold perpetrators accountable and to not grant amnesties. Um, so the question is what, what happens here? Can we say that amnesties are now less appealing. Um, it, it's not looking like we can say that, that we would more likely expect this to dip and rise over time. When you look at the actual cases too, I think you can see it. I've highlighted in yellow the ones that occurred after the mid-90s, just to pick um, where we might expect the age of accountability to be showing up in effect. And so even in the trials without amnesty, um, meaning in the age of accountability, uh, do we see an increase in the number of trials that occurred without any amnesty laws? There are a few cases there of trials without amnesty. Um, and we don't have any cases of uh, trials with amnesty during that period of time, the second column. So it would suggest that um, you know, we are seeing some effect of being able to carry out trials or a new trend of carrying out trials without amnesties. But then when we look at amnesties without trials, um, we see quite a few that um, didn't bother with trials, that just used amnesties without any trials, suggesting that amnesty laws continue to um, to prevail. And then I had a, third, a fourth column in a paper, which we didn't put on here, which is no mechanisms. And there aren't as many of those in this later period. It's like 20% compared to 40% uh, in this, oops, 40% in this case and 30% here. Um, so again, it's not, we don't have really strong evidence to suggest either way that trials are uh, losing appeal or that they're uh, gaining appeal. We're just, the, the, the jury is out on this. Uh, but it does make us feel like uh, we maybe aren't completely wrong about the issue of uh, these mechanisms working together and that timing explains our findings. The context explanation is hard, as I said before. I mean, it really, you have to go beyond the quantitative research and really look at qualitative studies. And, and that's what we're carrying out now is trying, but we have to figure out which qualitative studies we want to do that help us test our argument more. Um, what we have tried to do is to look at one particular kind of context, which we can still at least use the scientific eyeball approach to analyze. That is, does it matter where you start? Does it matter where you start in terms of level of democracy and level of human rights? So if you think of Beth Simmons' work on human rights, uh, mobilizing for human rights, the argument is that um, you know, those countries that already have uh, strong democratic and maybe human rights culture are most likely to see improvements with the ratification of some of the, the international conventions. How does this apply to our work? Is it possible that the countries that are most likely to take advantage of transitional justice mechanisms are those that already have a certain level of human rights or democracy scores, right, if we use the polity or the other scores? And we've only done this for human rights, and we're not really finding, again, any strong evidence. They're all over the map. Our success cases, uh, some of them start at zero, meaning you know, not democratic. Um, I mean, sorry, sorry not, uh, not human rights protectors. And some of them started as high as six, right, in the high end of human rights protection. So we're not seeing a common pattern of level of human rights, and now we have to do the same thing with democracy to, uh, to, have, to convince us 
that there's an endogeneity problem. In other words, that what we're measuring as the outcome, democracy and human rights, is actually what's, what's explained by the input, you know, of level of human rights and democracy. Um, we also did some propensity tests and other, uh, other you know, statistical um, measures to see if we were really having an endogeneity problem, and that didn't really bear out. The other thing that I think is important, and again using eyeballing, um, when we mapped when these mechanisms occurred, so we took each of these countries that are our success cases, and we mapped the level of human rights and democracy, and we mapped onto that. I can't show it to you because it's, we haven't figured out a, an elegant way to portray this, right? Because you've got all these lines going different ways, and there's apparently someone named Stimson who's got a software package where you can, you can put these, uh, these line graphs together and show certain patterns. So we're, we're still looking for that software and maybe we'll have a way to portray this better. Um, but if you just look at what, when these mechanisms occurred and what happened in terms of human rights scores, we don't see anything that shows that amnesty is bringing down those scores either before, during, or after. Right. So we still feel like the amnesties are not what is, you know, is, is dragging down these pr this progress. They're not getting in the way of progress for human rights. Um, we're not sure. That doesn't help us say what they are doing positively, but at least we can be reassured that they're not getting in the way of progress in these cases. Okay. So that brings us to a regional um, explanation and whether Latin, if our our data is biased by the Latin American case. Um, first of all, is it overrepresented? Um, there are a lot of Latin American cases, both in the database of transitions, um, as I say here at the, the bottom of that section, 20% of the countries in our full sample are in Latin America, and 25% of the transitions are in Latin America. So that's a high number if you think regionally uh, about transitions. Um, but also, of the success cases, it's, they're pretty high, right? And they did use these mechanisms um, of amnesty and uh, trial, usually with truth commissions. So we have 15 of the 24 transitions in Latin America use this, comb this combined mechanism that we're finding had some success. Um, and, and, and those 15 also showed positive improvements. Um, but we're not, it, it, we're, what we're thinking about in terms of Latin America, because we're not, we did check in terms of controls. We use region as a control variable, and, these, and it still turned out to be positive um, for these co combined mechanisms. Um, what we're wondering about is whether Latin America actually provides us with a model. Um, because so many of these transitions occurred early, um, you know, in about beginning in the mid-80s, I mean, they're not as early as, say, Greece um, or Portugal or Spain, but they are early as a region goes. Um, and so they may suggest how countries get around existing amnesty laws or what you could call impunity um, when in, because most of these cases were either self-amnesties by the military that were then upheld by the democratic government, or they were new uh, amnesties after the transition that were blanket amnesties. Um, and still, through creative processes, courts were able to find ways around to still hold perpetrators accountable. In, and in some cases, even the subsequent amnesty laws that were passed, there were still ways around those amnesty laws. So does it provide us with a set of pathways for analyzing how you get around amnesty laws and reduce the level of impunity without jeopardizing um, stability? Right? It, is it the model for us to examine? So we've started to look at the Latin American cases more um, more carefully and more qualitatively. And what we've found is that there are these really interesting processes of courts doing test cases to see how strong the amnesty law is. And some of these are, for example, in the, uh, the Chilean case, which some of you may know, um, calling a disappeared person, 
and ongoing crime. Right? You, can't, you can't say that there could be an amnesty for what is still an ongoing crime. Until you find the body and determine that a crime was committed, you can't amnesty it. How can you give an amnesty for a crime that's not determined? So those are interesting kinds of test cases to see how strong is this amnesty and who, can't, who, is, uh, who can be prosecuted. Under, under this law. The truth trials in Argentina where they couldn't hold somebody, they couldn't sentence somebody to jail, but the international right to know what happened uh, allowed for the investigations to take place and paved the way for what is now, now that the amnesty law has been annulled, uh, has allowed for prosecutions to take place. Right? So these are sort of innovations that provide models for how you get around even blanket amnesty laws. Um, and those are probably the most uh, e extreme examples because there's something like a thousand ongoing cases in, in Chile alone and, you know, 800 in Argentina. So, um, you know, in most of our cases, you know, we have two or three trials um, that have been able to get around the amnesty laws. Um, there's been Supreme Court decisions that have had a profound impact on what lower courts have done. Um, in some cases, the Supreme Court and then the executive, this is the case of Argentina and Peru to some degree, have annulled the amnesty laws. They don't exist anymore. Those are really rare. In most cases, the interpretation of the amnesty law has allowed courts to, uh, even if it's in a single case, have allowed lower courts to then hold perpetrators accountable. So these are really kind of models that I think uh, could turn out to be significant. We can learn from the Latin American case to see how you get around amnesty, even if it was functional at a certain point uh, for the stability reasons that I've talked about. Uh, how, do they, how, how can you get around them to allow for accountability um, and, and important findings for the rest of the world? The one key thing, which I guess is off the bottom of this uh, PowerPoint slide, is the power of the Inter-American Court. Um, the Inter-American Court has been the most uh, aggressive, I guess I would say, in the world in deeming these amnesty laws that were passed in the region um, in, in violation of the American Declaration. Um, and so they've had a rippling effect in the countries themselves in how they, and the decisions of judges at the Supreme Court level and the lower court level. And we don't have inter-American court in, as active as an inter-American court in other regions of the world. The European court isn't nearly as strong on this issue of amnesty, hasn't been as active as the inter-American court. So that's gonna be one factor, contextual factor, that, that won't hold in other cases. So we'll have to see um, if, if in fact the Inter-American Court is maybe the decisive or at least a very important factor in these, uh, the renderings of the weakening of amnesty laws and the allowance of trials in the other parts of the world. So what's next? Um, as I mentioned, we're really trying to get at some of the qualitative research that allows us to do some nuanced uh, work on these, uh, on these cases. Um, we don't believe that all amnesties are like, we don't believe all trials are like, we don't believe all truth commissions are like, but when you put it into a database and you say yes, no, they all look alike. Um, and so now doing more research into those mechanisms is going to allow us to say, does it matter what type of trial took place, what rank the individual perpetrator was, uh, how many there were, does it matter um, when the trial took place, does it matter what the sentence was, you know, can you compare uh, the, the sentencing of Fujimori in Peru with the thousands in Santiago, I mean, does that give you a different sense of accountability um, and amnesty in those cases? The amnesty laws, um, we're finding that in the language of amnesty laws, they could be anything. They could be everything, political crimes and related common crimes is the language that's often used in their early amnesty laws. What does that, you know, what does that mean? Like who is covered on an amnesty law by, like that and can courts use that language and the vagueness of the language to say these weren't related? You know, if the objective was X, stability, you know, killing, uh, Jesuit priests doesn't achieve that objective, therefore it's not a related common crime, you know, something along those lines. 
um, and how have they been challenged. But most importantly, are we seeing maybe not, as I said earlier, that amne the frequency of amnesty laws may not be changing. Um, but perhaps the type of amnesty law is changing. And we have some evidence to suggest that new amnesty laws um, deliberate, um, explicitly exclude uh, international human rights crimes like genocide, crimes against humanity. Right? But this is in our investigation of the Latin American cases. Is this a general phenomenon that new amnesty laws are excluding certain crimes that are uh, protected in international agreements. Right? So that's something else to look at. And then as I mentioned before, we want to also look at uh, truth commissions and specifically what's driving our negative finding. It turns out that the, this, our findings have had some Im interesting policy, uh, have, well, I shouldn't say implications, but certainly policy dialogues. We were invited to talk to the Korean Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We were in Brazil talking you know, with them before they um, agreed to this uh, Truth Commission in Brazil after you know, 30 years of an amnesty law. Um, we also recently participated in this International Center for Transitional Justice Dialogue. Um, and we've, you know, talked to the Ministry of Justice in Brazil about some form of accountability. Um, but most exciting, I think, from our perspective is this new project we're doing with Amnesty International London headquarters um, because they want to begin an anti-impunity campaign. Um, and to do that anti-impunity campaign, they need more information about how courts have gotten around amnesty laws. So it's exactly what we're trying to do in the second phase of our research, and we've gone together uh, with a Amnesty International to seek funding to start doing nuanced studies of these amnesty laws and whether they've changed over time for amnesty to both target particular countries that are in violation of international law and also to think about mechanisms for courts and really for human rights activists to think about how you get around amnesty laws. So that's a kind of exciting project that, we are, um, that we're working on. More difficult for, for me to think about, oddly, since I'm in the academy and not in uh, the NGO world, is what are the theoretical contributions that this very empirically based research um, makes? And I think that uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that we're, we're going about considering it is that there tends to be, if, if you go back to my discussion of a maximalist approach, there tends to be a kind of legal fundamentalism in a lot of the human rights research. You know, if you build it, like if you build the courts, um, then human rights protections will come. And, um, and it's maybe too naive to think that courts can do everything. And so trying to think about what are the contingencies of when courts what makes courts capable of overcoming things like impunity in certain countries is, is I think, a nuanced approach uh, to the literature that will be an important uh, conclusion for us to draw out of it. But there's also uh, a me mechanical approach that I think we want to consider, which is why these mechanisms work. Why is it that courts do have this effect or don't? And why is it that amnesties don't get in the way or do? What is the connection between, you know, not just isolating courts and seeing what they do, but also what's the connection to societal and, uh, and, and existing movements for change that help us make our argument? So any thoughts you have about uh, those approaches would be, or any questions you have would be greatly appreciated. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Questions, quibbles, arguments? 
Throwing tomatoes. <laughs> no tomatoes allowed. Uh, you want to start? Yes. Um, thank you very much. That was re really fascinating. And I wonder if there's another variable in all of this. And it seems to me that if there's an appetite for transitional justice, there's also an appetite for significant legal and even constitutional reform. And I would be curious to, to know whether or not there's some correlation, either positive or negative, between cases where countries also change their laws to prevent the rise of authoritarian uh, practices again in conjunction with these truth commissions as kind of a preventative measure. Mm -hmm. The second question I have is, what advice would you give to the Haitian government right now? Oh because uh, <laughs> you know, they've had Jean-Claude Duvalier dumped on them, yeah. and uh, you know, it's been 25 years. Most of the population doesn't even know, you know they never lived through his violations. Yeah. And this is a, a really tenuous and unstable time for the country. Would you advocate a truth commission, a trial, which Amnesty International of has, of course, called for, or an amnesty? Okay, well, I'll start with the easier question and then move to the Haiti question. The easier question, uh, from my perspective, is, is the question about, um, about a, uh, the, the sort of inoculation, I guess you'd call it, legal inoculation from future authoritarianisms. Um, you know, and I would really like to have, you know, one of the, the questions we tend to ask PhD students is if you had a research genie, you know, a research fairy, um, what would the research fairy be able to produce for you that's, you know, that thing that you need to be able to make your argument? One of the things that we really want, really need, is a rule of law measure, right? Because these, these democracy and human rights measures are aggregates. Right. And it's very hard to break down what part of those measures are important in terms of the impact of transitional justice. Right? You know, is it all democracy? Is it one specific things like you know rule of law? And also, how much does the rule of law determine the choices made? Whether it is a more courts-based approach or more of a restorative justice, you know, truth commission type approach? We tried to use Linda Keith Camps. Um, judicial independent study, and it had so many missing cases because it's not a, it's not a, it's not broad, it's not cross-national enough, that we couldn't, we couldn't come to any conclusion. I've heard that the American Bar Association um, is creating a rule of law measure, and we tried the the World Bank, but again, we had too many missing cases. So I can't answer the question in terms of the, in terms of the finding. Uh, the findings we have or the data we have available available to us, and maybe we will be in a couple of years if this if this does turn out to be the case. My hunch is that a lot of those legal reforms are part of the transition process itself, sometimes by coercion, which could mean that they're cynical. You know, if you look at say USAID and their rule of law projects. Um, they're often very cynically adopted by countries because you get USAID money to come with it. So you build courts that are dealing primarily with commercial law and not human rights law. So it protects certain kinds of legal rights, but not others. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think some more nuanced data about what are the rule of law programs even doing? You know, uh, the work on Latin America is that it's really funding commercial law so that there's more trade rather than doing anything about citizens' rights right, and human rights even less so. Um, uh, and I, but I also don't know if truth commissions are a way around doing legal reforms. I mean, I'm I'm sort of pushing your question in a different direction than maybe you intended it, but whether I guess one of my hypotheses about our negative finding is that truth commissions allow you to look like you're doing something um, when you're not. And so in those cases, wouldn't we expect there to be no change or even a, a negative outcome? It, high expectations around the truth commission, and in fact there's more impunity than before, or, or um, recognition that there's greater impunity than, than there was recognition before. And that may be driving the 
the finding. There is, I was telling you about this last night, there's a, I think a wonderful book, um, but of course it's a former student of mine, so I guess I get bragging rights, uh, by Yelena Subotic called Hijack Justice. And she looks at the Truth Commission cases in, in Serbia, uh, Croatia, and Bosnia, and comes to the conclusion that these were constructed primarily uh, due to the demand, the need uh, for international aid, and not because of any commitment to human rights or to the truth. Um, or, and, and, and so it was a compliance with what has now become a kind of global measure of modernity or uh, anti-impunity, but in fact, if you scratched much below the surface of the yes-no Truth Commission, um, that it, it was quite um, unjust right? and, and without the positive benefits that we associate with Truth Commissions. On Haiti, so Haiti, man, Haiti is one of my, uh, one of the countries that I love the most because it's so complex <laughs> and, um, and also colorful in many ways. And, and the Duvaliers being the main reason historically that it was col colorful. Um, you know, uh, one of the things I study is political violence and, and Haiti's particular brand of, of political violence is quite unique. Um, but just in terms of expectations, my expectations is that when, no matter what Haiti does, it's probably not going to improve uh, the situation, right? Whether it's Duvalier, whether Aristide ends up returning and, you know, having any role, I don't think it's going to change things. Um, and that's sad, but, uh, but that's also Haiti. On the other hand, when we looked at the Haitian case, and I'm uh, looking at, a, at our chart here, um, the Haiti transition, Polity has two transitions for Haiti since 1974. The number, the dates don't seem completely appropriate to me, but there's a 1990 transition where nothing happened. No truth commission, no amnesty, no, um, you know, no trials. And in that case, there was, uh, were negative and same findings in terms of human rights and, um, and democracy, with one positive finding for political rights, right? So not civil rights, but political rights in Freedom House. In 1994, uh, there was another transition. That transition brought a set of trials, it brought a truth commission, and it brought an, two amnesty laws. Um, actually one right before, actually both of these amnesty laws were right before the transition, so it didn't, it weren't, they weren't post-transition. And in that case, you only found same and negative outcomes for, so it wouldn't be, it's not a case in Latin America, some people wouldn't put it in Latin America, but I, we do, and uh, it isn't a case of success, even though it used these combinations of uh, mechanisms. And that is, Haiti and also, Haiti is one of the cases that helps us think that context really is crucial to understanding this. But it's also a case in which you have two transitions where even doing something didn't, didn't make a difference. So, uh, and doing nothing didn't make, it had no effect, and doing something didn't have an effect. So in a sense, it doesn't hurt our findings. It just says, you know, where is transitional justice? You know, going back to this, this why do mechanisms work or what prevent them from working? Haiti may provide some insights into um, when it's impossible to do, to use transitional justice to bring about any positive effect. Not bad for a question I didn't know the answer to, I guess. <laughs> well, other questions? Thank you. I also appreciated your presentation, especially for the uh, methodological input that I think uh, I'll be able to um, look at in, in terms of my own dissertation work oh, good. on the road. Um, one of the things that um, often comes along with a truth commission is this notion of reconciliation. And the notion of reconciliation didn't come up in, in your presentation or the way you presented your results. And I just wonder if you think that idea or that concept has any um, impact on the uh, on transitional justice as it happens do do certain commissions that try to make an attempt at reconciliation or does does that have an effect on transitional justice or stability or or what does that mean 
for how we're even conceiving of justice because that's not quite um, it's not quite the the judicial justice that that I think you have in mind in terms of mm -hmm. structural change and all that. So just it, does it, does does the idea of reconciliation mean anything in in your research, or can you can you test for that at all, or or what are mm -hmm. the implications there? Okay. Um, well, I guess I have to be honest and say I really hate the term reconciliation. Um, so. No, I guess it doesn't have um, it doesn't have much value from our perspective. Partly because um, I don't know how you measure reconciliation. So you know, this is a quantitative study. Um, what are we looking for when we look at reconciliation? If it's nothing more than stopping the killing. Um, then I think our measure of human rights and improvements in human rights is in some sense measuring that, if that's all we care about in terms of reconciliation. But usually when we talk about reconciliation, we're looking for something more than that, right? Um, but from my perspective, to be completely honest, that's what's important, is that you stop the killing. And I think it's, in a sense, unfair to expect societies or even individuals to have to like each other or to have to get along. Um, I think it is important to, that people stop killing each other. But I don't think I even know what, it, what world it would look like that suddenly we're all reconciled and, I don't know, sitting around and, you know, thinking, singing kumbaya or whatever, you know, the impression is. And I don't mean to, to minimize the work. In fact, it's because I see it as such, uh, so difficult to reach. Um, and also my book on unsettling accounts is arguing that it's a huge burden on victims and survivors to have to reconcile with, with their former torturers or the killers of their family members. My expectation, and I think our expectation out of transitional justice is that you stop the killing. And the rest, you know, that you, that there's a respect for laws uh, is, is about all you can hope for and maybe all you should hope for um, because I don't know if forgiveness is possible or even politically desirable. Um, now, I realize I come from working on Latin America, and in Latin American notions of reconciliation is that it means amnesia, right? Um, that the human rights communities um, and victims and survivors are behind the notion of never again, right? Nunca mas. How do you make sure that it never happens again? It's remembering and you know, continuing to keep alive what that atrocity meant for people so that it's not repeated in the future. That seems to me almost a contradiction with the notion of reconciliation where we can you know, uh, move on. I, I think that there's, um, uh, I think it's, it's conceptually quite complicated. Um, and, uh, and you know, I mean, I think in, in my own work on unsettling accounts, um, I talk about the importance of the expressive truths that would come out of a truth commission, you know, or other mechanisms for gathering truth about the past. But changing our um, changing our ideas about what that means and what it means politically is being able to get those truths out in the open and to talk about them, debate them. Uh, and I call this contentious coexistence, not reconciliation. The contentious coexistence in which someone said, I did this, you know. I carried out these kinds of atrocities and it seemed to me to be the right thing to do at the time. And then to have the audience, you know, in a sort of deliberative democracy framework, the audience to these confessions to be able to challenge it. How could this ever be the right thing to do? It's not contextual. These are, you know, these, this is what, what that meant to me and the losses that it meant to me. And to have an ongoing argument, really debate in society about these atrocities, not try and reconcile them, um, not try to find a way that, that there you live in harmony, but that you actually continue to debate the harm that this has done, not just for that generation, but future generations. Um, so it's not a, it's, it doesn't, 
you know, I, in this project, I can't think about how you would put it in there. Uh, into this study. There is an interesting project ongoing in Africa by David Backer and Anu Kulkarni, um, where they've done some surveys. I think it's eight, up to eight countries now that they've surveyed, and they have a National Science Foundation grant to do this. And what they're finding is that, uh, that and uh, this is great, I think, because there's very little popular opinion polls about these mechanisms. So uh, Kulkarni and Back are actually doing those popular opinion polls to see, you know, do people care? We assume people care, but, and how do they care about it? And they're finding actually something that I find um, frightening, which is that it, it, it relates to what we're finding in our statistical database, that there's also a lack of um, uh, positive views of truth commissions at the individual level. Um, and regardless of what we might call the, uh, the ideal form of truth commission and the very flawed version of truth commission, that, and I think that may go with the beast, you know, the expectations about what truth commissions can do is so high, they can't, po they're sort of doomed to failure, they can't possibly do this, and reconciliation is one of the things they can't possibly do, right? Uh, and so this survey is, is kind of confirming that finding, even though it's a little sad that, uh, because I think we all saw truth commissions as being a really important feature of, this, uh, of, of dealing with human rights, um, and that both quantitatively in our study and, and in the survey study is not turning out to be um, having that kind of effect, but we have to think, I think in other ways that it may be having a positive effect. And so I would see truth commissions and other forms of uh, debate about the past having a positive effect in learning how you do live together in peace and you live together with disagreements. Right? And that that's crucial to democracy, you know, that you actually have an opportunity to, be, to debate and disagree even though you share values around human rights. and and political participation. Oh, okay. All right, any other questions then? Uh, Sarah's? Yeah. No, go ahead, sir, please. Hi, thanks very much. Um, I've really appreciated the, uh, the presentation, and, and like Adam, I, I, uh, we're doing uh, quantitative uh, research methods right now, so this was could terrific. You, could you speak into the mic sure. so people forgot to hear you? Um, so thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I, I might have missed it, but I'm curious. You're, you're uh, focused on this idea of the mechanisms, which you've laid out really quite nicely, and why they work. Um, you're thinking about why they work and why they might work in some situations and not others, and perhaps um, together in certain ways. Have you looked at uh, cases where there's been um, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure how you're characterizing it, human rights vi violations, where none of these mechanisms have been put in place, and if so, mm -hmm. um, what's happened there? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a paper I wanna write for Law and Society, and I'm calling it the dog that doesn't bark. <laughs> in that we tend to, in transitional justice, and really actually in a lot of different areas of social science research, look at the dog that barks, right? Where do we see a positive impact um, but not, or where do we see where these mechanisms did exist, right? I mean, two different ways to approach it. Um, and not, what about the cases where there's nothing, right? That's the dog that doesn't bark, there's no mechanism. Or what about the cases where there's not any positive outcome? Can we learn more from those dogs that don't bark as opposed, and, and, and not always look at the ones that, uh, where there is the, the barking dog, the finding we're looking for, the mechanisms we're analyzing. And I'm really excited about it because I think it's going to be, I mean, I shouldn't say this because, you know, we build our careers on being right. It may be what proves us wrong, um, which is what if we find, for example, that in all these cases where um, they did nothing, there were also improvements in human rights just because there are improvements in human rights in the world today. One thing that I think is not going to, that I don't think that's going to happen because what I've been reading about, there's some new studies on um, human rights data collection 
and what they've found particularly in, these, in the U.S. State Department reports and in Amnesty International reports is that there's much more reporting. Uh, so the information effect. And with more reporting, you're going to also get more reporting on violations. So that when we see that there's increases in human rights violations, we have to be a little bit skeptical. So the only thing that we can really be confident about is where there's actually deterioration in human rights violations. Because then the, even with the over-reporting or the information effect, you're still getting declines. I'm sorry, you're still getting, uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Even where there is over-reporting, if there's a decline in human rights violations, that means we can be pretty confident that that played out. If there's an increase in human rights violations, that may just be a reporting uh, phenomenon, the information effect phenomenon. So we can really be confident about our, uh, our improvements, but not in our declines. Um, so uh, so th it may be that we will find that, uh, or we may find that it's completely, and I would expect that there to be um, very random effects, and it, you know, it depends on the country and where it took place, whether there, um, where are the, whether there's a consistent pattern in evaluations. Otherwise, I would have expected this to show up in the statistical analysis since we included what we used to call de facto amnesties, that we were scolded for using that term. Um, we didn't know what to call the cases where nothing happened. We figured it was a de facto amnesty. Um, but several, in several times we gave this presentation, people said, but if they had a trial next year, you know, the year after you did your study, then it wouldn't be a de facto amnesty. So you're not telling us enough about what's going on there. So one other reason to look at these cases where there aren't mechanisms is to see what's going on there and whether we can say it's a de facto amnesty or whether we can expect there to be a trial next year. And there may be discussions about it. So I think it's going to turn out to be really uh, important and useful to look at those cases in more depth. There are a lot of them, which means for actually getting the work done, on, we've got two, almost two and a half years on this grant. Uh, to do the kind of qualitative research that we want to do is going to take a lot of work. And it's another thing that's, that all of you who are going to be searching for research funds have to keep in mind that some of the stuff you really want to research is the stuff that's less fundable. It's very hard to make an argument for why you want to go look at cases where nothing happened, you know? Um, no, no one wants to fund that. So we have to figure out how to sneak it into this project and still get the work that we did get funded done. Um, and, and I think methodologically, it's key um, and for your, you know, for anybody's research to start looking at that. I, we did a training in, on qualitative comparative analysis. I don't know if any of you have done this QCA research. And one of the things I really like, it's Charles Reagan, who's a sociologist at University of Arizona, and you should all, uh, if you have the opportunity, first of all, it's Arizona in January, Tucson in January. We were there for the shooting, which wasn't too uh, pleasant. But other than that, to get out of the cold and go to hike in the canyons in the afternoon and take methods courses in the morning is fantastic. Uh, and they have a social network uh, methods training, kind of a camp for uh, four days, I think it is. Um, one of the f fascinating things about QCA is it uses a lot of the logic of quantitative analysis, but in small end studies. So uh, where you don't have, like we have all the countries in the world. And so we wanted to do it for when we start disaggregating and doing, well, let's say we only want to study the cases where nothing happened. It's going to be a smaller N, and we might not get the kind of statistical significance that we want. Or let's say we want to only study Latin America, or only, you know. Uh, and the assumption in QCA, which I love, is that the, you can't assume the opposite of your finding, right? You can't assume that if you use these mechanisms and you have the positive result, that the failure to use them is also going to produce a negative result. You don't have that mirror effect in QCA, which is an assumption in, in, in much of the, uh, the quantitative approaches that we use in, in social science. So we are trying to do some QCA work on this to see if, if we can find the same um, strength. So far, we're not finding a lot. I mean, we did find that uh, 
using all mechanisms had a positive effect. So that confirmed what we found in that, you know, TJ versus no TJ. But we're having trouble with once we've begun to disaggregate it. We're not sure whether it's, we don't know how to do it well enough yet or whether, uh, you know, it's just not, not working um, in terms of confirming. It doesn't confirm any of the other theoretical approaches we have, um, but we're also not getting enough there, so. Thank you. Um, I, I should mention that you were actually on our, our reading list earlier this week for Kathy Hochstetler's class on democracy and development. So of course, okay. it's, a, it's nice to be able to. So you uh, all bought my book, and I'm getting more royalties now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not I, quite. <laughs> I, I think it was a journal article or a printout. Oh, so okay. um, I, I just have a question about initial conditions, um, which doesn't really fit into your model. There is lots written about. Uh, how transitional economies, their success or their character is determined in part by what the, by the characteristics of the regime it replaced. Um, and similar research in transition to market economies from uh, command economies. So I was wondering uh, with transitional justice, is um, the, the character of the preceding regime or of uh, you know, the level of violence or so on, um, if you've uh, looked into that angle about how that affects uh, both the success and the, the design of uh, the transitional justice. Yeah, um, what I didn't go into detail with in today's talk, because it just would have been longer, is the adoption part of, uh, of our work. And, but I did keep a slide in here into the talk so that if somebody did ask me this question, I could uh, wouldn't have to remember <laughs> if I could actually use what we what we have. Um, so most of what we found in terms of what explains the adoption of particular mechanisms uh, verifies what we maybe already know from doing any readings. So you know, as I mentioned, the the notion that Linz and Huntington had talked about uh, that collapse or defeat of an authoritarian regime is more likely to lead to trials. So we can think about the Argentine example. You know, the the junta collapses over Malvinas uh, or the Falkland Islands, and uh, um, and they you know, in a sense, return to the barracks, and then they're put on trial by the first democratic government. Right. Um, and we also found that um, this also meant, let's see if I find it on here, that, um, well, it's actually not on this, that the opposite, which is that there is a negotiation, this is I, this I mentioned, that the negotiation of a tr of, uh, between the authoritarian regime and the democratic, uh, the new democratic government would more likely lead to amnesties. It actually leads to amnesties and truth commissions, okay, but not trials. Um, and your particular question, it sort of fits into this notion of history of democracy. Did, did, hi, did the history of democracy um, have any impact? And you can see that the history of democracy did tend to lead to certain kinds of uh, tr trials, probably because there were trained lawyers and experience with courts and so on, but also truth commissions and lustration. Um, the things that we found to be the most surprising are, are in yellow here. Um, we would have expected that abuses committed a long time ago might have allowed for amnesties or, or maybe in some cases trials. You know, but the problem with trials is that there's evidence problems, right? So, you know, there's statute of limitations in most countries, even um, even for m murder. Um, and so uh, maybe it's not so surprising, even though we, we expected there to be more amnesties, that you would have truth commissions in that, in that case, is that there's a sort of safeness in exploring the past um, and, and maybe not to giving amnesties. Although we're re really not, I'm just making this up because we really don't understand the finding. Um, we would have also expected with shorter regimes that there might have been more of a drive to, um, to trials. Um, and we would expect longer regimes to have led to amnesty, you know, the argument about the degree of complicity, 
in society for long-term authoritarian regimes uh, is more likely to lead to amnesty because everyone is, in a sense, guilty. Everyone participated. Everyone was a collaborator in some way. So how do you start picking out who were the most guilty? Um, and rather than deal with that, you would have amnesties. Uh, so the shorter regime finding doesn't quite square with what is expected in the literature and what we might have thought logically to be the case. I already mentioned the kind of economic health thing, is that we, if you were to read the normative literature on, um, you know, which I've referred to here as maximalist literature, economic conditions should not change the normative commitment to putting perpetrators on trial. But we actually find that economic conditions does seem to shape adoption. Uh, there may still be a normative commitment, but it shapes what societies are able to do. Uh, so we, we looked at that. And then, and maybe the last thing that we found kind of interesting about um, the challenges, some of the literature in the field, is the contagion notion. You know, that countries with uh, borders, with shared borders, are, li are likely to do what, uh, what the other does. We found a negative result on contagion looking at borders. So it was more likely that you would not do what the country, the neighboring country would do rather than what, uh, what that country did. And um, it, it, Kim and Sikink have used a different measure of contagion where it's cultural and linguistic, right? So you could put Spain in with Latin America or you, you know, Portugal and Brazil and, and, um, and they found it positive in terms of contagion. So, uh, so it depends on how, you know, what, what we're theorizing about contagion and um, where you might find this surprising or not. The last thing that I found kind of uh, intriguing, I didn't put it in yellow here, is that when we looked at what kind of international factors were relevant, um, we didn't find much in terms of trading relationships, which the literature might have theorized, you know, that you, and as I mentioned, that hijacked justice notion would be uh, our countries with trading partners, certain trading partners more likely to adopt trials or truth commissions rather than amnesties. But we did find that ratifying the, the Convention on Genocide turned out to be significant. Not other conventions, but the Convention on, on Genocide was significant in terms of, and you know the Convention on Genocide is one of the few conventions that actually states that there must be punishment for, um, for, for crimes of genocide right, and torture. So, but CAT, the, the Convention on Torture, also has that and it didn't turn out to be statistically significant in our sample. So it, it may be worth going back and, and looking at it. And I guess the last thing that I'd say in terms of international factors is that um, we looked at the presence of INGOs, um, international non-governmental organizations. And this is another data problem. The, the data is pretty crappy for the most part. Um, and so you have tons and tons of international non-governmental actors active all over in, country, in every country. So to try and figure out how do, we, you know, how do we measure the strength of INGOs? Uh, in the end, we ended up just saying we're Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch present because those are two international non-governmental organizations that are active in, you know, all around the world and have promoted trials as uh, the only acceptable way of dealing with the past. You know, not truth commissions, not amnesties, but trials. So we would have expected them to have that. And we actually did find that um, to be true, but, um, but again, we're not really happy with the data on INGOs and even less happy with data on NGOs. So if anybody wants to do a really important project, uh, try and figure out how you measure the strength of NGOs and human rights, because there's not good data out there. So...
Okay, the other way you can be a giant is you wear taller and taller shoes, <laughs> heels. So I wanted to tell, talk to you about this book. It came out in September. Um, and I think it's fitting given our audience because this book I published with my graduate students at Wisconsin. I was at University of Wisconsin-Madison for 17 years before I left and started at, um, at Oxford three years ago. And uh, so the book, because there's so many graduate students in the audience, I thought you would be intrigued by this, that I taught a course on transitional justice, a seminar. Um, and I had the students tease out all the hypotheses in the literature on transitional justice. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term transitional justice, by that, I mean just very generally how countries deal with the authoritarian or post-conflict uh, past, the conflict past. And we look specifically at the mechanisms used to, dealing, to deal with that past, like human rights trials, um, truth commissions, reparations, lustration, amnesty laws. So the students did this enormous task of reading the literature and mining it for hypotheses, and then their assignment was to use those hypotheses in a single case study. Um, and so they did that, and sometimes working in teams and doing regional studies or multi-country studies, but mainly they did single case studies. And at the end of the semester, a couple of the students who are uh, Tricia Olson and Andy Ryder, my, um, my collaborators in this book, said, why don't we do a cross-national analysis to see if any of these hypotheses hold up um, in, in comparison across cases instead of generating more single case studies, which was about where the literature was at the time. And so we did it. We got a little bit of money from the department and then... Okay, everyone, could I... Uh, let's get started, and uh, we're very lucky today to have a giant in the field of human rights with us uh, today. Uh, and uh, I think we have uh, no one more fitting than our own giant of human rights to, uh, to introduce her. But before I turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Howard Hassman, uh, just a quick announcement to the PhD students. Uh, we'll be meeting in the Sunshine Room uh, after this with Dr. Payne. So. In the range of possibility, but more importantly for us as human rights scholars is does it make a difference if you do have a trial or a truth commission or an amnesty, etc. And we decided to, to measure that by looking at human rights improvements and improvements in the level of democracy. And we picked those two goals partly because um, we we're interested in those political goals but also because they're measurable. There already is existing data on improving uh, human rights and democracy. 
So I'm going to tell you what our findings are and then uh, talk about what we're doing now to think more about those findings. Uh, just briefly, um, we cover every country in the world and we start gathering data in 1970. Uh, we finished in 2008 um, and we we're going to do, one of the things we want to do is to bring that up a little, little um, you know, to, to a couple more years. And we used as our source of data the Keesing's World News Archive. And we chose this source because we felt that it was the least biased. A lot of the other studies, now there are a few more studies that do cross-national analyses, use U.S. State Department reports. Um, we thought Keesing's had a broader coverage, not just where the U.S. was involved, but also, uh, also covered more of the range of mechanisms that we were looking for. And as I mentioned, we really look at these five sets of mechanisms, but most of what I'm going to talk about with you today are the first three that are up there, uh, trials, truth commissions, and amnesties. The reason for that is we're not convinced that we have uh, a full set of cases of lustration and vetting or uh, reparations. We have very small number of reparations. We know there are vastly, uh, there's a vast more number of reparations, but they didn't come up into Keesings. So I'm going to report mainly on these three mechanisms. It's important to say a little bit about how we defined these three mechanisms because most studies uh, use their own definitions. And so the field, if you could call it such, the field of transitional justice, doesn't have consensus on what is a trial, what is a truth commission, and, and certainly not on whether amnesties should be included in tra transitional justice mechanisms at all. Um, in terms of a trial, we decided that we wanted to see if a verdict had been rendered and that we would only count those trials in which there had been a verdict. Our assumption for that is that in many cases, trials can be shelved um, or dismissed. And so if, there hasn't, if it hasn't been completed, meaning that there hasn't been a verdict, then we felt like we couldn't include it since we wouldn't uh, expect uh, perhaps for those trials to have an outcome uh, or have an impact. But we are now looking at something more broadly called judicial activity to see if the cost associated, the sanctions associated with even being investigated or charged and arrested could have that deterrence effect in terms of human rights. So I'll come back and mention that again. Um, <clears throat> in terms of Truth Commission, we also, um, in our case, we included even those Truth Commissions, which might seem to you a bit contradictory, um, because you might think that a report would bring closure to a truth commission the same way a verdict does in a trial. But many truth commissions came to an end and they still never published a report. Right? So we look at truth commissions that do have an end date, not the ones that are ongoing, but we didn't limit our study of truth commissions to those with a report. Our argument is that report might determine whether it was successful or not because then it's more publicly accessible. So it would be more a measure of success rather than whether a truth commission existed or not. Um, but others only include truth commissions with reports. So uh, that's one way in which our data is different than others. We have not yet found any transitional justice study that includes amnesty in a database. There is an amnesty database put together by Louise Malander, but she's not focused on transitional cases, and she's not also focused on uh, human rights violations. Um, she's at the University of Ulster, and you can get this uh, data online if you're interested in looking at it. And we're now crossing our amnesty information with Louise's to see if we're coming up with the same set of amnesties for these kinds of violations that we're looking at. But a lot of the literature doesn't, from the political science department at Madison, and then we applied for money, so we got, we just continue to get uh, little pots of money here and there to pay them and make their way through graduate school, and, to, and we hired some research assistants at the undergraduate level, um, and much to our surprise, we actually came up with some findings um, and, and actually got a book published out of the project. This is published by the universe, United States um, uh, Institute for Peace, which gave us one of the grants, so one of their 
um, stipulations is that we also publish our book with them. So it came out in September, and I want to thank um, our my hosts here uh, for the opportunity to present these findings to you. What I want to do is not only um, tell you uh, what our findings were, but also to go beyond that. You know, that was in September when it came out, which usually means I can't even remember when we stopped writing it, but you have to stop well in advance of getting it into print. So we've since done a little bit more thinking about it and begun to sort of challenge our own um, findings in the book. So I'm going to present for you a sort of summary version of the book and then some of the post-publication tests that we've been, uh, we've been developing to see if we're right, <laughs> to sort of pr further probe if, uh, if we still agree with our findings now that they're published. Uh, and I'll just jump to the punchline. It might surprise you that we do still agree with our findings that are published in the book, uh, not surprisingly. So the book, I don't know if you can see very well up here. We've had to do some little manipulations to get things to work, and, and it's kind of faded a bit. But the book is, is really looking at two different sets of hypotheses. One set is why do countries adopt these mechanisms? in the first place? Why do they uh, adopt truth commissions or trials or amnesties or lustration or reparations? And in that, that's really most of the book is probing that question. Um, but what was more interesting for us is the second, you can't even say second half, the very end of the book, which is what impact does it make? So you adopt these mechanisms, and it's interesting to know what mechanisms are within